Yes, Matthew uh, chapter 4 and verse 1 to 11 is a fairly well-known account through Scripture. Jesus being tempted in the wilderness is something that many of us will have read of uh, or heard of or thought about in the past. It's tempting to just focus on those temptations and see how they apply to our lives. And it's true that many of the temptations that Christ faced do apply to our lives. And we'll think about that uh, a little bit. But actually, what comes through this whole account is just how great Jesus was and just how great the plan of salvation he was going to bring about was, just how determined he was to do it in a certain way and not bring it about in a way that the humans of the day, or even us, may have expected. Jesus came to this earth as a baby, but he came to be king. He came to be a conquering king. Many at the time, and even today, would expect a conquering king to rally a crowd about him, to come with an army at his back, boldly proclaiming that he is the king. And yet we don't see any of that in Jesus. And we don't see that in this account today anyway. At all points, we're reminded that Jesus was better than Israel as well. And that's something to bear in mind. This account, as you know, takes place after Jesus's baptism. Last week, we finished on chapter 3 and verse 17 that said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus starting to begin his public work, publicly baptized. We saw the spirit of God descending upon him and the father announcing that this was his son, all three persons of the Trinity in action on that day. A few things may have happened between then and our reading today, but we don't know what, but it looks like it was an instant thing. It looks like as soon as Jesus was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. It's a strange thing for a king, isn't it? To have this sort of public announcement of your your sonship of God, almost, and then go into the wilderness, retreat into the middle of nowhere. But that's what happened. Jesus went away to be tempted by the devil. That's how his ministry would begin. Now, it's important to note that we have to be a bit careful when we talk about temptation and testing. God does not tempt anyone to do evil. James chapter 1 and verse 13 reminds us of that point. James chapter 1 and verse 13 says... Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God does not tempt anyone to do wrong. However, he does use times when we are tempted in order to test us. He doesn't do the tempting. And Peter puts it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The devil tempts us to try and derail us, to try and take us away from the narrow path that we're called to walk upon. However, God, when he tests us, does it to prove that we can pass the test. God tests to build up. The devil tempts in order to destroy. The devil does the tempting, but God can use that for his glory and for our strength and our faith too. So here we see that in a picture of that. We see the devil doing the tempting, but it was the Holy Spirit that led Jesus to the wilderness. God is going to use this situation. We continue before we get to any of the trials with verse 2, which says, after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, 
he was hungry. Now, growing up, I don't know how I knew this, but how I thought this, but I always thought the temptations of Christ happened during those 40 days. And I don't know when, but that was the picture I had in my mind. But this is after 40 days of, of, of fasting, after 40 days of uh, starvation. That's when the devil came to do the tempting. Apparently, 40 days is about the human limit of endurance of, that you can not eat for before permanent damage is done. I can honestly say I've never gone 40 days uh, without eating uh, in my life. So I'm nowhere near where Christ was at that time. But I can imagine how he would have been. He would have been weakened and, and probably in pain, remembering that Christ was fully human. So he experienced the same weaknesses that we do. And at this time, we notice the devil coming. And we also get our first comparison between Jesus and Israel. The Israelites were sent for 40 years into the wilderness for punishment. The Israelites were sent for 40 years into the wilderness because of their disobedience. However, Christ went into the wilderness for 40 days as a direct act of obedience. Already, Christ is proving to be better than Israel. As soon as the Israelites were in the wilderness, what were they doing? They were complaining that the food they had in Egypt was better than what they have now. Jesus went for 40 days before he was even tempted to eat. And that's when the devil comes. And we see our three trials. I have no headings today other than trial one, trial two, and trial three. Um, I'm sure you can work out where they appear in, in the order. But the first trial, trial one, says that in verse three, the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I'm always intrigued by some of these trials as to, to where they come from, because we see later Jesus turning things into food or, or water into wine or, or making enough food out of a, a small picnic he made feed crowds and had more left over than he'd begun with. Clearly, God allowed him to do those miracles. And what is the difference between that and turning stones into bread? Clearly, it was within his powers. Ultimately, He'd been led into the wilderness to be prepared for ministry. He'd been led into the wilderness and God wanted him to fast. Clearly, God didn't want him to turn those stones into bread. Or he could have done. But maybe it's more than that as well. Maybe it's because it was the devil telling him to do it, that he simply had to ignore it. Or maybe it's because the devil was testing him to say, if you're the son of God, prove it. A few weeks earlier, we'd heard those words. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And now the tempter comes and says, if you're the son of God, prove it. Maybe it's not about the food at all. Maybe it's all about the proof of him being the son of God. But Jesus didn't need to prove that to the devil. Jesus didn't need to show the devil that he was uh, the son of God, because he was. The devil was one to be ignored. And Jesus proves that by resisting him. He resists him with scripture. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Quoting uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 8, once again pointing to the fact that Jesus is better than any of the Israelites. What did the Israelites do when they received that manna? They were told only collect enough for what you need for one day. The rest will be there another day. Instantly, they went out and collected more than they needed. And it turned to, to well, it turned disgusting overnight. Once again, Jesus is, Jesus is showing that he is better than them. Even though he was to be despised and rejected. And even though by the religious, the religious elite thought he was a heretic, he's proving that actually he was far greater than they were. Remember, the devil tempts 
for bad. The devil wanted to disrupt Jesus in some way through this trial. It was well within Jesus's powers to turn stones to bread, but that would have been for his benefit. I have a question that I don't expect anyone to answer this morning, but you can speak to me later. Does Jesus ever, through scripture, do anything, do any miracle for his own benefit? Does Jesus do anything solely for his own benefit? But are any of the miracles at all done for his benefit at all? Now, I couldn't think of any, and I'm, you may come to me at the end and give me a list of 50 different times when Jesus acted for his own benefit, but I don't think he did. At no point did Jesus use his divine powers for his own benefit. And that's what the devil is trying to, to get him to do here. But Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and Jesus reminds us that God's word, God's wills, and God's direction is more important than the nourishment that he needed. At that time in his life, I would imagine food is the thing he most wanted. What is it that we most want? Whatever it is, God's word is more important. God's plan for our lives, God's instruction, God's direction is more important than any of our worldly desires. Secondly, we find Jesus at the top of a temple. In verse five, we read, the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands, he will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Another interesting temptation. The devil takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple and says, throw yourself off. If you're the son of God, surely he'll uh, bring some angels and they'll save you. Later in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 53, we read these words of Christ in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 53. Uh, this is uh, speaking to Peter after Peter had cut off the ear of the high priest. He says, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? He will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. So again, this is clearly something within his power that Jesus is able to do. It's interesting to think what the point of this trial even was. We understand the food, Jesus was hungry. We understand the next one. Jesus came to be king over the world. The devil offers him dominion. Here Jesus is at the top of a temple being told to throw himself off it and bring wings of angels, uh, bring angels to, to save him. Ultimately, we see it as putting the Lord to the test, which is how, uh, which we'll come back to in a few moments. But what else would he have gained from doing this? If you think Jesus had lived in obscurity, Jesus, instead of being baptized and then marching on Jerusalem, had been sent into the wilderness. After this event, Jesus returns to Nazareth and Capernaum. Jesus didn't seek to bring a great, to gather a great crowd of people around him at this time particularly. What would have happened if Jesus had thrown himself from that temple and been carried away from it on the, the wings of angels, a temple in a city full of people? I would imagine he would have instantly overnight gained a following, all just impressed by this ability to fly or be saved by the angels. But that's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus didn't come to gather crowds around him based upon miracles because they wanted to seek something. Jesus came to bring God's word to the world. Very often when Jesus does a miracle, he does it in secret or tells no one to talk about it. Often when he did more public miracles, they were to back up his teaching. And our mind goes to the man that was lowered through the roof by his friends who was paralyzed and uh, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And the, 
the, the Pharisees say, how can you say your sins are forgiven? And Jesus says, okay, well, I say, get up, walk, almost as a, as a visual proof of your, the, the statement, your sins are forgiven. Jesus doesn't use miracles to gather a crowd about him. And that's what would have happened now. People would have gathered about him in a way that wasn't how he wanted. It wasn't how God wanted him to act. So Jesus says, no, I'm not going to throw my, myself off of the, uh, the temple. Interestingly, through this trial, we see another way that the devil acts. He tries to use scripture against Jesus. He quotes from Psalm 91 when he says he will command his angels concerning you. On the other hand, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. How amazing that the devil can use all sorts of things against us. And we have to be so careful what messages we're taking. We have to be so careful, even with scripture, not to take it out of context. Or we could command ourselves to do anything and claim that it's scriptural. This encourages me to know my scripture better. So that if I do hear of something out of context, I can understand a little bit more. The devil still tries this, if you are the son of God, go on, prove it kind of strategy as well. But Jesus doesn't need to prove he is the son of God to anyone. To refute the devil this time, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And verse 16, which I'd like to turn to very shortly, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And verse 16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. Now, Massah uh, and Meribah were places where the Israelites complained about not having enough water. They put the Lord to the test. They grumbled against him. They didn't have faith in him. Jesus is refuting the devil saying, no, I'm not going to. But once again, he's pointing to the fact that he's better than Israel. When they were in the wilderness, when things weren't going their way, they put God to the test. But Jesus would not do that. Thirdly, and uh, finally, through these trials, before we see how we can apply them, uh, we find in verse 8 to 10, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Now, we know that Christ was hungry at this time, and to be offered bread must have been quite some temptation. But we also know that Christ came to take dominion of this world. Christ came to be king. But he also knew that that was going to come at a price, that he was going to have to live a life of sacrifice and ultimately be mocked, be humiliated, be sacrificed. And through the book of Matthew, we see how Christ realizes that more and more and prepares his disciples for it. But Jesus was fully God. He must have known what was going to happen in some way. What the devil is doing here is offering Jesus the crown without the cross. He's saying, I can give you dominion of this world and you won't have to suffer. All you need to do now is bow down and worship me. This will be far easier than going through this life that's going to lead you to the cross. You see, the thing was that the dominion wasn't the devil's to give. A few different verses uh, kind of bring that point together. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his, throne, on his glorious throne. It was already known that Jesus would come again, come back, sitting on his glorious throne. Jesus was already king of the world and he already would be king of the world however in john chapter 12 and verse 31 we read these words john chapter 12 and verse 31 says this now is the judgment of this world now 
will the ruler of this world be cast out? So we have to accept that the devil had some dominion. The devil had some power in this world. But Luke chapter 1 and verse 32 says this. He, Jesus, will be great and will be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there of his kingdom. There will be no end. So, yes, the devil had some dominion. But the crown wasn't his to give to Jesus. The crown was God's to give. The devil once again, uh, sorry, Jesus once again points to the inadequacy of the Israelites by quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13, uh, when he says, you shall worship the Lord your God, him only shall you serve. One of the Ten Commandments given to the Israelites. And what were they doing as God was giving them those commandments? They were at the bottom of the mountain, building a God for themselves to worship, building a calf for them to bow down to. Jesus wasn't going to do that. He recognized, he knows that the only thing to worship, the only person to worship is God himself. Worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve so there we have the three trials one for food one for a following one for power all things that christ would ultimately have all things that christ could have done and were within his power however none of those things were at the right time the devil couldn't offer any of those things truly so why did all this happen? Why was Jesus led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Jesus still hasn't begun his public ministry at this point, and that public ministry would begin almost as soon as he leaves the wilderness. Three years his ministry lasted on this earth. And during those three years, the trials that he faced in the wilderness would often in various ways be repeated. We would often see similar themes again. But instead of in private, they were in public. Instead of just the devil tempting him, there were crowds of people. A lot of the trials were magnified. Jesus was prepared in the wilderness in private for his public sufferings that were to come. God uses testing to build us up, to strengthen our faith and to encourage us. Jesus' testing was used in a similar way. But he didn't need preparing. He already showed, I was about to say shoe, which is a suffocism. He already showed that he was fully able to resist the devil. But later on, if you take the theme of the stones to bread, Surely Jesus was tempted to eat at that time. Surely later on, when he hung upon the cross, he was tempted to use his divine powers to take the pain away. Surely, as being fully human, he would have been tempted to use his miracles, the power that he had, for his own benefit in some way. What about the, the not being thrown, not jumping down from the temple? Surely it would have been tempting for someone as mighty as Christ to gain a following by his miracles. Surely when the people were rallying against him, telling him he wasn't the son of God, telling him he wasn't the king of Jews, telling him he was a heretic and a sinner, he could have clicked his fingers and done something to prove without shadow of a doubt, exactly who he was and what he was. But that's not why he came. Surely he would have been tempted to call the angels to save him as he was hanging upon the cross, give up on that plan of redemption and wipe out the people that had, had, uh, were punishing him. Surely there was a temptation. I don't know. But Jesus was prepared to resist those temptations. What about worshipping the devil? 
Well, I don't know that Jesus would have ever, ever been tempted to worship the devil. But would he have ever been tempted to make his mission easier, his task simpler? In Luke's account, after Jesus is in the wilderness, we see him return to Nazareth and he preaches and the people don't like it. So they drive him out of the town and he's above a cliff. Jesus came to give his life as a sacrifice. At that time, he could have let the crowds throw him from that cliff. It would have been a clean and instant death. Would it have counted as a sacrifice? I don't know, but it would be a lot easier than what he went through on the cross. And yet we can already see that Jesus is prepared not to make his task easier. He was prepared to resist the devil in the wilderness and he was prepared to resist the temptations to do so later on. All of these temptations that Christ faced in the wilderness, we can see pictures of at the cross. So that's maybe why it happened to Jesus. If you disagree with anything I've said there, please speak to me uh, later. But what do these temptations mean to us? What does reading of Christ's temptation mean to us? Obviously, we can see a picture of resisting temptation. We can see a picture of using scripture, knowing our scripture, to know when we're being tempted to do wrong, even though some of those things might seem right. We can use scripture, we can use our knowledge of God's word to resist. We obviously see that we should resist the devil. It's very easy to give in, it's very tempting to give in. And that's why the devil attacks. We can see that the devil attacks in different ways. He uses our weakness, he uses our desires. Sometimes he uses good things to tempt us to lead us astray, to lead us from how God would have us live. Sometimes it's very difficult to spot what those temptations are. And that's why we need to be all the more careful. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, we read these words. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We need to be alert. We need to be watchful, resisting the devil, resisting temptation. What temptations might we face? Well, like Jesus was tempted possibly to build a crowd as he would have thrown himself from that temple in front of everyone and been saved by the, uh, I was about to say the aliens, by the angels. Sorry, that was a slip of the tongue. Saved by the angels. Isn't it tempting as a church sometimes to try and build a crowd based upon the wrong thing? To skip the word of God because sometimes the word of God is difficult and offends people. But we should be building ourselves upon the word of God. However many people are here is a distant second at least to sticking to the word of god what about jesus and the stones to bread that was for his own benefit it wasn't what the dev what, what god wanted him to do how often is it tempting to focus on prayer for ourselves and what we want rather than glorifying god through prayer and rather than praying for others and finally and i think we can see the third trial that, that Jesus faced in all of our lives. Jesus was offered the chance to make the devil his God in order for an easier life. How tempting it is to make all sorts of things idols in our own lives in order for an easier life. How tempting it is to put things before God, before his plan, before his will for us in order to make our lives easier. Man does not live by bread alone. You should not put the Lord your God to the test. And you should have no other gods before God himself. Finally, through it all, don't we see how great Christ is? Don't we see what a wonderful saviour we have? Someone that can stand firm, resist the devil against anything that he threw at him. Verse 11 tells us that after all of this, the devil left him. Behold, angels came and were ministering to him. 
Jesus resisted the devil and the devil left him. To return, Jesus would face temptations again. But for now, the devil left him alone. What a great saviour we have. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. I thank you for the picture of resisting temptation we can see. And I pray that you'll help us to live holy lives, to resist the devil and all of his schemes. Lord, help us to be alert and be watchful. Lord, help us to appreciate just how great our saviour is. And Lord, help us to uh, see how tempting it must have been for him to resist the cross. How tempting it must have been for him to make his life easier. And yet did none of that, but willingly walked on that road to Jerusalem to give his life for us. Lord, help us to be in awe all the more every day of our wonderful saviour. Amen.